How's it going guys? It's been uh, well a little bit of time since I filmed, a couple weeks now I feel like. And um, yeah, I kind of took a little bit of a break in the month of March from filming on such a, a consistent schedule. Uh, I was doing like seven days a week like you guys know for a long time, like six, seven months. And I just got a little bit burned out, need a little bit of a break there, breather I guess. Uh, but here we are, we're going to film again. Uh, before we get started on that, I think I mentioned in the last video that the March Madness Tournament was starting. And the team you might want to consider rooting for is Gonzaga. They've never won a title. Um, last night against UCLA, they played what many people are considering in one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, game of one of the greatest games of all time in college basketball tournament history. Um, if you haven't seen the final seconds of the game, uh, there was a game-winning shot. Gonzaga did win in overtime. And it was just cathartic. It was incredible. They do play tomorrow night against Baylor uh, for the championship. And they've, they've never won. And Baylor is a very formidable opponent. Uh, UCLA played amazing. Uh, nobody thought before the game they would be able to hang with Gonzaga. And they certainly did, which causes me great concern going into Baylor. Baylor's game. So uh, I'm going to be watching that tomorrow night. And uh, that's all I've got for that for now. I'm going to link that video of the final play in the description. You guys can check it out later. Let's get to this problem. It was asked by request by YouTube username Joey. And so it's on my problem request form. If you would like to make a request, I'm more than a month behind, two months behind right now on the request list. Uh, but you can go to my channel about info page and it's linked on there. Uh, there's even a button for it, I think, on the uh, like the banner that, on my About page. So uh, feel free to use that um, as well. It comes from the 2011 AMC 10B problem number 20. It was also the 12B problem 16. Rhombus ABCD has side length 2 and angle B is 120. Remind yourself of what a rhombus is. All sides are equal. It's a parallelogram. It's not necessarily a square. It's definitely not in this case. Uh, let's try and draw what we're reading about right now as we go. So I'm going to try and make a 120 degree angle approximately look like that. I'm going to try and draw this side to look about equal to that one. Let's go a little bit larger, I guess. And then we'll come over here. We're going to come down here, and it's probably not looking as good. It's not that bad. It's, it's pretty okay. We're going to call this angle B, A, B, C, and D. This is the 120, of course. Uh, some properties of rhombi or rhombuses, whichever one you want to say, um, you might want to recall. The diagonals are perpendicular, and they bisect opposite angles. These are all things that you learn in geometry. They should definitely be in your small notebook if you haven't added them there yet. So here we go. Uh, what does it say? Region R, we don't know what it is yet, consists of all points inside the rhombus, only inside, that are closer to vertex B, this one, than any of the other three vertices. What is the area of R? Um, it's funny, on the very first page of my favorite geometry book, I will link this in the description again as well. It's uh, very old now. It's from Jurgensen, Brown and Jurgensen. I think it, uh, some high schools still use it, middle schools don't. They've switched to some newer material. But on the very first page, they give you this conversation. And for me, I always think back uh, to this conversation. And it's got this problem here called a game and some geometry. And it talks about this tree and this fountain. And this was the first I ever learned in geometry. This is one of the books I used when I was in high school. And I think it's phenomenal at teaching the subject better than modern middle school textbooks do. Um, a lot better, in fact, and how I feel personally. There's a lot more proofs in here, too, than there is in the modern textbooks, which I appreciate. Um, and so in that problem, it alludes to this idea that between that fountain and the tree, there is a set of points that is equidistant from the fountain and the tree, uh, or the whatever it was, the pole and the tree, but the two things that it was equidistant from, two points. And we just need to understand, because that is the most important underlying concept of this problem, a problem number 20. Yes, aged, but you could still see this problem maybe as a 12 or a 13. Not exactly, but similar concepts applied in the modern era. 
And so all you have to do is think about it. What would be all of the points that are closer to, let's say, B than C, right? Well, all of those points, there's probably a midpoint if we connected these, right? So we know the midpoint's part of it because that point is definitely equidistant from B and C. But furthermore, the perpendicular bisector through M, obviously, that's what it means to bisect, it passes through the midpoint. Every point on that perpendicular bisector is equidistant from B and C. This is easily provable if you connect here to here and any random point, you know that this is 90 and 90 and this equals this and you know this is equal to itself, so side, angle, side. Those two triangles are congruent and hence this distance and this distance are equal. Based on that fundamental concept, we do almost, that's almost going to carry all the heavy work for this problem. So let's get into it. Um, if I draw this one right here, the one that connects B and D is actually one of the diagonals. We've already said what happens there. It bisects the opposite angles. So it's going to be 60 right here because it was 120 before. And let me just try and draw this straight on so I can make it look as close to accurate as possible. This is going to be 90. We want all the points on this side of that right there because AC is perpendicular and it hits the midpoint. It's a property of parallelograms that the diagonals bisect each other. So it's definitely a property of rhombuses or rhombi as well, which means this length is equal to this length. Furthermore, we know what this length is. It said that the side length was two. So if this is two, so is this length. Why? Because that's 60, this is 60 up here. Um, in the basic rhombus, if this is 120, you know that the angle here is 60 because the sides being parallel, same side interior angles are supplementary. So you know this angle down here was 60, uh, over here and here, it's equilateral. Therefore, this is one and one. This is 30 degrees here. Um, so opposite 30 is one, opposite 90 is root two, opposite 60 is root three. We're definitely going to need that. Let's start by finding the area of the rhombus. It is an orthodiagonal, which means its diagonals are perpendicular and its area is half the product of the diagonals. That's my favorite way typically to find the area of a rhombus. So what do we got? We've got two here and two root three here. So it's gonna be half times two times two root three. The half and the two canceled. The whole rhombus area is two root three. We only wanna consider the upper half because those are the points that would be closer to B than to D, right? It's the half of the plane on one side of the perpendicular bisector. So let's continue on then. We know that the part we want has an area of root three, but it's not all that we want. We still have to consider A and C. Well, we just continue this process. We're gonna drop a perpendicular bisector here. And then you're gonna do the same thing here. And it doesn't really matter where they meet. They meet somewhere, probably at D actually. I think they do if I think, yeah, they do, right? Um, because that's the altitude of DBC and the altitude would hit D. And there's reasons I'm not going to go into right now that we know it hits at D. But we want this region in here, but it's this awkwardly shaped region. We don't really have a formula for a, rent, a weird pentagon like that. Maybe we do, but even if we did, it'd be overly complicated. It's going to be so much faster if we just consider that these triangles on the ends here are 30, 60, 90, where this is one. How do we know it's one? That's a midpoint. This is bisected. The whole thing was two, one and one. Since one is opposite of 60, if I wanted to get opposite of 30, I would divide that by root three. So that triangle that looks like that, um, this would be one and one over root three. And I might not even have it right. In fact, this should probably be larger than the one, but maybe I didn't draw it accurately or something. I think one, uh, no, no, root three is 1.7 approximately. I thought for a second it was 0 0.7, huh? Yeah, it's actually smaller. So it's, it's drawn proportionally, if you will. But for a second there, I was like, wait a minute. Okay, anyway, uh, now before you go finding the area of this triangle right here, why, why bother? Why don't you take both of the triangles and put them together and make a rectangle? Try to look for opportunities to save time in calculating. Rather than half base times height two times, 
make a rectangle, one times one root three, one over root three is the area of that rectangle. And we're just gonna take this big triangle now, subtract the two triangles, which make one rectangle when you combine them, and you're gonna have root three minus one over root three. Now, first thing you should look, do you see this up there? No, you don't. So, because you don't see it up there, we're gonna have to manipulate it. But it just means change its appearance until it matches something we have up here, and if it doesn't, we've made a mistake. But first, let's just get a common denominator. You might rationalize this. I think I'm gonna multiply by root three over root three, and that's going to give us three, because uh, the top's gonna be three right here, three minus one over root three, because they have the same denominator now. So you're gonna get two over root three. Let's see, I don't see any root threes in the bottom. We're gonna have to rationalize. That means you're just gonna get a root three here, and no more root three there. Two root three over three, we see that as answer choice C. That is how it's done. I went a little slower than you would go on a competition because I'm trying to explain fully the background. You should definitely remember the formula for orthodiagonals. That should be in your small notebook. It goes for rhombuses, it goes for kites, it goes for any orthodiagonal. Those are not the only two kinds. Further, you should remember the collection of all points that is closer to one point than another is the half plane on that point's side of the perpendicular bisector, okay? So that should be a small notebook concept. It doesn't come up a lot, but when it does, you know, it's worth knowing. You should also know that the collection of all points equidistant from two points is the perpendicular bisector. Why do we wanna write that down in our small notebook? Because it's not typically how you think of those concepts. Usually you just think of what it is. It's a perpendicular bisector. It hits the midpoint and it's 90 degrees. What? No, think about all of its connections. All of those connections combine and the quicker you can connect those dots, the faster you're flying through this problem, getting it right and on to the next question. Um, that's it for this time, guys. I will hopefully see you sooner than the two week period that took place this one. And maybe by next week I should have filmed again by now. So uh, have a good one. See you guys later.